Which King James Bible, study Bible, would you recommend? I've been asked that quite a few times. And uh, people send me, you know, what do you think about this study Bible? What do you think about that study Bible? So I wanted to put together a video here. Uh, not a real super duper in-depth uh, study into the lives of the men who wrote the... Nothing like that. Just to give you some a quick overview of these. I have six different study Bibles here arranged into three different categories. And I want to show you what I recommend and why I recommend. Okay, the first group I have over here, on my left hand, these are two study Bibles, which we have the Defender Study Bible by Dr. Henry Morris, and the Local Church Bible Publishers Bible here on my uh, left here, on your right, and this is the Schofield Study Bible. Okay, now these two study Bibles. The Schofield, I, I think, is a better one than the Defenders, but both of them, in the text, the, the notes, you're going to see somewhat of a critical attitude towards the Scripture, towards the text of the King James Bible. You'll see some, well, you know, the two older manuscripts actually are, don't have this. Schofield writes like that. Uh, Dr. Morris a lot of times will say, you know, this could be a translation error. You're going to see some of his philosophy is actually actually somewhat Alexandrian in that only the originals were inspired. No translation is inspired. The party line of the Alexandrian cult. He follows some of that, and I don't, I don't like that. I have a problem with that. So you have here study notes that are critical of the text of the King James. And then you have here... Here you have, over here, the Ruckman's Reference Bible. Over here, the Common Man's Reference Bible. Now, these are study Bibles where the text, the study notes are not critical of the text, but in fact, they exalt the text. And they, you know, both do a good job of explaining certain passages, but exa actually exalting and uplifting the text of the King James Bible and, and convincing you that it is the words of God that you're reading. And so the text there, the commentary, is more of a complementary to the text. So you have critical of the text, complementary of the text. Over here, we have the Rainbow Study Bible over here and the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. This one is the big one. This is the one I've gotten more requests to do a video on the Thompson Chain Reference Bible than any other thing out there. Uh, people all the time. What do you think of the Thompson Chain Reference Bible? Well, this is going to be the video that will answer that. Now, these two over here are a different classification from these two here. These do not have commentary. They might have some little notes over in the sidebar or something, but for the most part, these refer you, it's comparing Scripture with Scripture. The Rainbow Study Bible, of course, uses collar coding to show you this is about prophecy, this is about salvation, it's about God you know, things like that. Thompson Chain Reference Bible will link you. One verse talks about Jesus as the shepherd. This takes you to over the, to this one, talks about Jesus as the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. On to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one. So here you have scripture with scripture, without any kind of notes, any writing of men explaining the scripture. So these are three different types of study Bibles that you can get as a Christian. So let me show you some closer detail. We're going to look at that now. I'm going to show you some of the details of this. I'm going to show you a couple of verses, a couple of the notes and things, and show you why I recommend or don't recommend these particular Bibles. So let's take a look. All right, here we have the Rainbow Study Bible. Now this this is a the paperback one. I found this. I wasn't actually planning on doing a review on this one, but I found it at a local store, and so I picked up a copy. I cannot recommend the paperback. Uh, maybe I got a bad one with bad uh, glue or something, bad binding, but I brought this thing home. I wasn't even tough on it. I mean, you can see the spine is perfect there. There's no wrinkles in the spine. I didn't really crack the thing open. I know how bigger paperbacks are. They're very 
usually very weak in the spine. This thing was sitting upstairs in my computer room, which gets it gets hot up there. But look at this. I have total total separation. I mean, the thing just came apart, and I didn't even use it hard. So I don't recommend the paperback one. I do believe that they have a a leather one. I would recommend that. I would not recommend the uh, paperback edition. But uh, this one here, if you've seen other reviews on this, it has the different uh, things here up at the top. The purple there is, is for God. The orange there is for discipleship. Dark green for love. Orange for faith. You can see them. I don't have to read them to you. But that's what these different collars are for. The different collar coating in the text there lines up with back here. So it's an interesting concept. I kind of followed the same thing with my own Bible. I kind of came up with my own collar code. But I uh, just want to show you a couple things in here. Here you have, in the book of Jonah, you have this little map. And, you know, you kind of say to yourself, I wonder where Nineveh was. I wonder where, you know, Jonah left. And I wonder where the he got swallowed by the whale and all that stuff like that. Well, right here, you have a little map. So I thought that was kind of handy. Usually you have to go to the back of the Bible. But just throw a little map in there like that. I thought that was kind of neat. I like that. Let me show you something else here. Uh, again, key places in Acts. There you see some of the different uh, familiar places. Kind of hard to read, I guess, here on video. But uh, you'll hear about, here you have Antioch, down there is Alexandria, right there. This isn't where the real Bible comes from, it comes from up here. <laughs> but uh, just different things, Thessalonica, you know. But I uh, just want to show you one thing here. It's kind of a little bit of a problem. On the back, we have light blue means salvation. And... Uh, there you have gold as prophecy. So you have light blue and, and gold as prophecy. Here in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, uh, and that's basically the same color there, it just kind of is a little bit darker. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, down through verse 17, is talking about the rapture. Now, Technically, that is salvation. That is part of your salvation, the per or redemption of the purchased possession. When you go to be with the Lord, that's the completion of your salvation. You're saved from the wrath to come, which goes into talking about down here in, in chapter 5. But it's also prophecy. See, so to collar it all, one collar, you know, there, there are m numerous passages that have multiple doctrinal applications and, and things. You know, it's just a small critique. I'm not, I wouldn't say don't buy it because of that, but just to show you there, yes it is about salvation, but it's also about pro or prophecy. So you get kind of a, a novice Christian come along, they might not see it as a prophetic thing there. Maybe. Just a little bit of a criticism. Not too bad. But again we have Revelation here. And there you have the Isle of Patmos being this little one right there. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Again, a good help, you know, for a, a new Christian. I think it'd be a, a great help to them. Okay, now we have back here, you have the end of Revelation. Here you go to verse 21. Here you have supplemental study aids. Goes down through. They do have a lot of good study aids here in the back. But a lot of this stuff is tainted uh, with Alexandrian type philosophy. Here you have uh, between 300 and 200 BC the, the Septuagint Old Testament in Greek. Uh, wrong. Sorry. This whole story of the Septuagint, the 72 elders, and all this stuff, there's a lot of problems with that. The oldest extant copies of the Septuagint are all AD. I'm not aware of one copy of a BC Septuagint. 
So watch out for some of that stuff. They try to claim that the Septuagint was used by Jesus and the, and the disciples. Not true. Not true at all. But it goes down through there, and, and you know I could point out some other things, but um, here we have know what God says. Uh, some interesting little things there. Again, I'm not going to pick every single little thing apart, but uh, you know I'm just doing a quick review here of these Bibles. 100 popular Bible passages. Just an interesting little help there. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these. Over here we have 365 popular Bible quotations for memorization and meditation. Some more relevant verses there, and, and again they're color coded. You learn one every day you know, your, of the year. And they have a couple other ones here. Personal daily Bible reading calendar. Over here we have, this is, I get kind of get a kick out of this one. Words which have changed in meaning. Now some of these are kind of ridiculous. Accuse. Slander. <laughs> well that, that, you know, oh that's much more modern than accuse, you know. You hear people all the time, don't accuse me of that. That's not archaic. Give me a break. Admiration. Wonder. That's not archaic either. Now look at this one. This, this is a good one here. Let me, let me zoom in a little bit so you can get clear. Barbarous people, barbarians. <laughs> you don't need to write that. That's not clearing anything up. I mean, give me a break. Barbarous people, all the barbarians. Oh, that's how we use it today. Yeah. Sure. Um, here we have bloody, bloodthirsty. <laughs> Come on, that's not archaic. Boy, that was the bloodiest movie I ever saw. Man, that thing was so bloody. I love this next one here. Look at this. Charity, love. <laughs> um, William Tyndale's Bible said love in 1 Corinthians 13 rather than charity. Okay? But if you go back into the 1300s, John Wycliffe's Bible said charity. So there's always been a debate whether it's charity or love. I have a sermon on that. It's supposed to be charity. Charity is, is self-sacrificial love. It's a much deeper meaning than just plain old love. All right? But again, it's not archaic. You define it by the text over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. See, see how they do that? Um... Here again, they do another new version tactic. The NIV will replace damned with condemned and damnation with condemnation. So they say, well, this is archaic, you know, and this is a modern updated, we can understand that better. Well, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. People today know what damned means. You better believe that they do. How about deceived, enticed? That's not clearing anything up. Give me a break. Here's another archaic word. Well, you're really going to need help with this one. Here we go. <coughs> Evil. Oh, man. Oh, what's that mean? You know, trouble, bad. Uh-huh. Easter. The Passover. <laughs> yeah. Come on. That's not archaic. You're correcting the King James reading with the New Version reading. Pascha, the Greek word there, can be translated as Easter or Passover. It's dependent on the, the context. And the context of Acts chapter 12, verse 4, is Easter. There have been so many videos on that issue. How about this? Dragons, jackals. Look at that. Doctors, teachers. Now, come on. These are archaic words. You can't tell me that people, you know, Dr. So-and-so, you know, like Dr. Smarty Pants, Come on, man, that's not archaic. Devils, satyrs, that's not clearing anything up. And a devil is not a satyr, by the way. That's just showing some ignorance there. But uh, let me zoom back out here again. They go through more of these, a couple more. Um, here we have uh, gutter, water course, down here heresies. Uh, Lucifer, they have Day Star. I mean, it, it, some of these things are just kind of 
I mean, there's really no nice way for me to put it. It's kind of stupid, really. These words which have changed meaning. It's a it's a subtle thing. It's a little bit of an attack, but it is an attack nonetheless on the King James Bible. Some of the words in there they try to change King James Scripture words to new version readings. So I'm against that. Here you have your concordance, which is fine and everything. Going through there, it's pretty pretty good size concordance. Uh, okay, and then we go to the index to the maps, and then you have your maps, which they get the uh, the trek there through. The Exodus, you know, they, they get that trek there, they get it wrong, it goes like this. As we'll see there with the Common Man's Reference Bible. The correct one. And there you have your maps. Personal study notes section. That's kind of nice. Of course this one's removable, you know. Because the glue came undone. Just, you know, front and back there. So there we have the... Rainbow Study Bible in paperback with the detachable spine and the pages that fall out. Um, would I recommend this study Bible? Yeah, I don't think that it's, it's that bad. It's it's uh, you don't have it being the text is not cluttered up with man's writings with what the text is supposed to mean or anything. Uh, all in all, I think it's pretty good. I would not buy the paperback edition unless you know how to glue things back together. I wouldn't waste money on this thing. This thing here cost me $21.99, so $22 basically down the drain. I'll have to figure out how to glue the thing. But I uh, just want to do a little review on it quick. So there you have the Rainbow Study Bible. Okay, the next Bible in our review is the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. I get probably more requests to do reviews on this thing than just about any other Bible out there. You know, what do you think about the Thompson Chain Reference Bible? What do you think about the Thompson Chain Reference Bible? So, well, here we go. This is it. Here we have the, the box. Picture of Mr. Thompson down there. You can see the price is... Uh, Seventy dollars that I paid for it. Now there are nicer editions out there of this Thompson Chain Reference Bible. I think that they have just about every one of them at the KJVStore.com. You can go there and check it out if you're interested. But we'll do a, just a quick little review here. I'm not going to do a extreme in-depth kind of a thing. Thompson Chain Reference Bible. This one, this one is a, a bonded leather, but it seems to be fairly high quality. I haven't really found that much wrong with it yet. Uh, some of the different goes into the, what it's about here and ways that you can study and all that. I thought this was kind of an interesting little map here. Little diagram if you will. You have the Old Testament. There you have the Pentateuch, first five books, books of history, poetry, major prophets, minor prophets, Here's the river of inspiration. It goes over here into the 400 silent years, then it comes out. And you have history, which is uh, Matthew through Acts. And it goes over here to the Pauline epistles, Romans through Hebrews, and then the general epistles, James through Jude. And then you have Revelation at the end. Okay. Just thought that was kind of a neat little illustration there. I like older illustrations like that. Always kind of find that intriguing. And here you have Genesis. Now I'm going to demonstrate the thing of how the Thompson Chain Reference Bible works, but right away, whenever you put man's writings into God's Word, you're going to have danger. Okay, so you have Genesis, and right there, RV. So he's referring to the RV, it's, and he gives you an alternate reading here, the way it says in the Revised Version, Westcott and Hort's Bible. There was evening and there was morning, one day. 
Now, that's, you know, it's supposed to be the first day. That's a definitive article in front, in front of a singular word. It can only mean one, the first day. One day messes it up. Okay, that gives you all kinds of problems can enter in there. It's just one day. No, it's the first day. So, right away, we see a problem there. References to the revised version. All right, so we start out, we have a little bit of a problem there. We go to the next thing I have marked here. Here we are in the book of Psalms. Zoom out a little bit. Now we'll go down here to the familiar Psalm 23. I'll show you how this Thompson chain thing works. Here we have the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And you go over here. Christ shepherd. Okay. So you see it there. Christ shepherd. Now you can either go to the back of the Bible where 3264 is, is and it has all the scriptures listed. Or you can follow the chain to the next time that it appears. Okay. So it says there Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11. So now we'll go to zoom back out here. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd, he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Very interesting there. Again we go over here, feeding this, the flock there, and we have Christ Shepherd, 3264 again, John chapter 10 verse 11. So we go to John chapter 10, let me just, before we go there, let me just kind of zoom back out here again. Another neat little illustration here of Christ being the one that ties the Old and New Testament together, fulfilling the law. came not to, uh, I can't think of the way it says it right now, but it, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to, to fulfill the law. And then, of course, over here, he brought the New Testament in with the shedding of his blood in the book of Hebrews. So just a neat little, another neat little illustration there, but we're going to go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 11. Many of you are familiar with this verse. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So again, you see the thing there, Christ shepherd. Then it goes to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20. All right, we're not going to go to each one of these, but you see it again, 3264. Now you can go to the very back, and I'll show you that in just a little bit here. But see, it's it's nice. You know, anything over here, you know, that you see, here you have a wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, it'll take you forward. If you want to go back in the chain, well, you have to go back here to the back of the Bible. All right, now I'm going to show you here in Revelation. One little issue that I have with it, which is a very common thing, and uh, even my Cambridge Bible does this. Yet again, always be wary of of uh, when man starts to put things into the text. Revelation chapter six, you have there, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him, him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, <coughs> and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is a reference to the Antichrist. But look what happens over here. And again, you have RV, you know, that's no good. Uh, takes you to Revelation 5, 1, Revelation 14, verse 2. And then it says here, the conqueror upon the white horse. And it takes you to Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 is Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is up here opening the seal. Okay, 
Jesus is not the first seal, the Antichrist is. The false Christ, That's and compare the two. In Revelation chapter 19, you have the rider has many crowns on his head. This one only has a crown. Revelation chapter 19, a sharp sword proceeds out of his mouth. Here you have a bow in his hand. See, they're not the same. You say, how do you know that? Compare them. <laughs> Things that are different are not the same. So just a little bit of a warning there. Show you some other things here. Here we have Revelation chapter 20, 1351 and 1353. It's talking about the great white throne judgment. Okay, that's what this is talking about. This is a, a judgment of the unsaved dead. All right, this is not a judgment for the Christian. Right there you can see the great white throne. So a great white throne, down here's a judgment. This is a judgment for the lost. That's their final judgment before they are cast into the lake of fire forever. So we had 1353. Here we have judgment according to works. There you have judgment seat of Christ. There you have the great white throne judgment. They're not the same. A little bit of danger in that too. Again, not not you know you could say well it's it's just a you know reference to different judgments. It could be, but, you know, again, a new Christian, they might get a little bit confused about that. They might think that a Christian is going to go to the Great White Throne Judgment, and they won't. Christians are not going to be there other than to just watch the thing, just to witness what's going on. Um, but basically, here you have uh, all of the different uh, subjects and things. I mean, this, this, this back in here is just incredible. Let me just show you here quick. You have from here to the very back. That's all study helps here in the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And you know, I'm just I'm picking out a few little things here, the little references to the RV. You can cross them out with your pen. Uh, I mean, this is some really good information. And you go back in here, and he has the scriptures typed out for you, so you can see subjects. How that how that they go through the Bible like we saw earlier the the shepherd Jesus says the shepherd the Lord is my shepherd and it goes through the Bible it's the chain it follows through the Bible it's very very good is it perfect no but it's very good and and the thing I like about it is it's scripture commenting on scripture it's not some guy down in the footnotes telling you what the verses mean you're comparing scripture with scripture spiritual things with things spiritual that's the way it should be. This is a good study Bible. I, I like the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Uh, just one more thing here, quick. Let's see. Okay, we already did cover that. Here we have again words and their definition. And they do it again here. Charity, and it means love. No, it doesn't. It means self sacrificial love. There's a lot more to charity than just simply saying love. Uh, watch out for this stuff. Um, overall, I would say it's okay, these definitions back here. Again, I, I can't go through everything. Here you have a concordance. Pretty good sized concordance. Gives you a word and then the scripture references where you can find it. Back through, it's a pretty good sized concordance. Uh, there you have the scripture atlas and telling you the different uh, areas, cities, towns, villages, biblical names, areas, land features, points of interest. When you go into the maps, we're going to check the uh, path of the Exodus again. It's usually in most of these Bibles, and very few of them get it right. But you can see it's pretty good there. I guess they don't have it in this one, unless I missed it. But you have notes there. Again, some good note paper in this edition of the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Uh, real quick, I want to read something. This is an email a brother sent to me about the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. This is him, him giving his opinion of it. He used it 
for quite some time. It says here, so I now see getting the Thompson chain as a God ordained thing for me. Move the Bible out of the way. Because I read it a lot and really learned a lot looking up scriptures on topics. The fact that it uses uh, topical referencing verses, lots of commentary, is a very good thing for a newer believer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I believe comparing scripture with scripture is the best way uh, to learn the Bible. While the Thompson was very helpful to me as a young believer, as I've matured as a believer, I have discovered some issues as I believe one will with any uh, study Bible. Here are pros and cons to my mid-sized Thompson. Okay, first we have the pros. Font is pretty readable. I like the font and layout. Which, you know, yeah, I agree with that with this one here. There is some room in the margin for notes depending on how thick the references are for a given passage. Uh, no reference markings in the text for a cleaner read. Let me just stop there for a minute just to show you what he's talking about. I've got to get it right side up there first, I guess, don't I? See, you just have the text there. References are over here in the, in the sidebar. So that is kind of a nice feature. Back to this email thing here. Uh, no, or topical reference. References help a believer understand biblical views on topics with scripture instead of commentary. I agree. Interesting and extensive Bible helps in the appendix. Yep. Nice illustrations to teach how things in the Bible are organized. Again, I agree. Maps are some of the best of any Bible I have, which, uh, yeah, for the most part, reasonably well built in genuine leather, but not leather lined. Opens and stays flat at the beginning of Genesis. Uh, paper is decent for marking on and durable enough for rigorous use. About as non-denotational or pet of pet doctrine or pet doctrine free as any study Bible I have seen. Of course, no study Bible is completely without these types of influences, and he's absolutely right about that. Cons. Has quite a few textual issues when comparing to the PCE test or the counterfeit KGB test. Not as bad as Ondervan was looked at, but still more than any of my Cambridge Bibles. Which, yeah, you know, some of the publishing uh, variations there. There are a few corrupt revised version notes in the margin. Not as many as there could be, but there are a few, which I showed you earlier. Uh, there is Bible history in the appendix that, to me, gives credence to the corrupt Nestle text and the newer Bible versions. I can't just tell these people are pro. I can just tell these that these people are pro Nestle uh, text, but others may not recognize that. Pretty much any time that you get a study Bible with a history of the Bible, you're going to get some of that Alexandrian philosophy. That's what I've found. Can't get a leather line version, which is the best and nicest in my opinion. Emphasis, Thompson Chain versus Holy Bible, C Spine. I'll show you that in a minute. The last verse in the chain does not direct you to the first verse in the chain. You have to go to the back of the Bible to find the beginning of the chain. So I kind of mentioned earlier. As you mature as a believer, you, you find that the verses chosen on topics are in a way commentary, but by what they chose to include or not include. Some topics seem to not include all the verses they should, but I'm impressed with what they accomplished. Took lots of work and I can't say I can do better. Yeah, it did take a lot of work to put this Thompson Chain Reference Bible together. I'm sure it did. Um, there you can see Thompson Chain Reference and here Holy Bible. All right. So yeah, you know, it could maybe say it down here or something or Holy Bible or here or something like that. Again, not a huge issue. It wouldn't uh, dissuade me from buying one of these things, but uh, there is some really, really good stuff back here. A lot of this I did kind of skip over. Uh, some neat study helps back in here. Kind of reminds me of uh, Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth, some of this stuff. A lot of information back in here. Um, Probably one of the most thorough that I've seen uh, as far as just a lot of information, a lot of things that you could study. Uh, this, this one I would say is a, is a pretty good Bible. would be a good Bible for a new Christian. Uh, not perfect. Not inerrant. But 
pretty good. Definitely pretty good. Showing you some of the things here. Some of the interesting little drawings and, and notes and just a lot of information, a wealth of information. Um, some of the old paintings of what people thought Christ looked like. Again, you know, you got to be careful with some of this stuff, but all in all, I'd say this is a pretty, pretty good Bible. Uh, would I recommend the Thompson Chain Reference Bible to a new Christian? Yeah, I would. Definitely. Seems to me to be a, a pretty, pretty good deal here. So, as I said, I think the best resource that I know, best place I know of to get these would be the KJV store. I saw they have quite a few of them, pretty good prices. Alright, up next we have the Defender Study Bible. Uh, this is by Dr. Henry Morris. And this one was given to me by a friend. It's a hardback edition. Put this dust cover on the front. Um, basically we'll go here to the beginning and we're going to start seeing some of the problems right away with this with what Dr. Morris has to say. Defender Study Bible Introduction to the Old Testament. <clears throat> there is no doubt that Christ and the Apostles all believe the Old Testament scriptures to be divinely inspired and infallible, inerrant, uh, authoritative written word of God. Okay? Which is fine. But then he goes down here to say, Furthermore, no English translation of the Bible is perfect, though it is our conviction that the so-called King James Version comes closest to the ideal, and neither is any specific Hebrew manuscript of the text. The doctrine of inerrant inspiration applies only to the original writings, called the autographs. Now you got a big problem there, because Paul said to Timothy about the scriptures that he had, that he called them inspired scriptures, and he says that thou hast known uh, from a child... Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So if he knows the Holy Scriptures that are the inspired Word of God, uh, he didn't have the original autographs. So this kind of, this is Alexandrian philosophy right here. Uh, these original autographs have long since vanished. In fact, it is just as well they have, for otherwise men would have made idols out of them, but we can still have confidence in the accurate preservation of the original text. But how do you know? See, if you say perfection only existed in the original autographs, you don't know what they are. See, this, this is the source of doubt right here. Why did this need to be put into a study Bible? It doesn't need to be put into a study Bible. So right away we have a problem there. But let's continue. Now, Job chapter 30... I'm sorry, uh, chapter 40, you go down here to verse 15. Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, eateth grass as an ox. It goes into who, or describing behemoth. We go down here. The word behemoth means simply huge beast, and commentators uh, commonly take it to be either an elephant or a hippopotamus. The subsequent description, however, fits neither of these nor any other living animal. On the other hand, it seems to match the probable description of a great land dinosaur, such as the Tyrannosaurus. Uh, so you have that is right. Okay, a lot of your commentaries that you will buy, King James Bible commentaries, study Bibles, they won't get this right. I agree with Dr. Mars here. I do believe that Behemoth was a dinosaur, what we would call a dinosaur. Of course, dinosaur is just a modern word, too. Gotta watch out for that. Um, <clears throat> but we'll continue. Just gonna hit a couple places here. I went right by them. Uh, the New Testament. Here we have it again. Uh, here he goes into the thing again of he has to do the originals only thing. Presumption of inspiration and inerrancy, of course, applies specifically only to the original autographs. Again, why is this necessary to put into a study Bible? You're going to shake people's faith by doing this, and it's a stupid argument anyhow. 
Uh, nevertheless, we can have confidence in the almost perfect preservation of the New Testament as originally given. That, it's, it's a nonsense statement. We can have perfect, you know, uh, great confidence, excuse me, in the perfect preservation of something that we're not sure of. See, th this kind of absurd stuff needs to disappear from the mouths of Christians and from the writings of Christians. This is doubt. This is confusion. All right? we, we can be reasonably sure that we are not reasonably sure what the originals said, but even though we know that they're perfect, but we've never seen them, that we think that we've seen perfect uh, copies of what we don't know. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that really helps me, you know, in my stands as a Christian. Uh, this is not to say the King James translation or any other translation in any language is perfect. We got a problem there because there were numerous translations in the original autographs. Uh, Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, Jesus speaks to him. Well, he was Saul at that time. Jesus speaks to him in Hebrew, but it's recorded in Greek. All right, Paul later goes on to talk about how that the voice that spoke with him spoke in Hebrew. You know, so th this kind of thing... You know, and translations, no translation is inspired. Well, then the originals weren't inspired. Disappointing that he would have to put that in here. But now, here we have Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to show you a common boo-boo that is made by a lot of commentators. And he gets messed up here and then he messes up a whole bunch of other places. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2. And he's talking about here some things. The two phrases are often used synonymously. Kingdom of God, Kingdom of Heaven. In Matthew 13, uh, so there seems uh, no adequate reason to try to disting disting distinguish between them. Uh, yes, there is. Okay, now there are some references where the Kingdom of God can apply to the Millennial Kingdom. But there are other references where the Kingdom of God is a clear reference to the spiritual union between God and man, the spiritual fellowship there, the kingdom of God, being spiritual and not physical. The kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, in every single reference, is always a reference to the physical, literal, millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Every single time. You can study it out. You say, we'll prove it. All right, we'll go to the proof text for that. And we'll see how he botches this. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay, we're not talking about a spiritual kingdom here. We're not talking about where God is. Nobody's going to take where God is by force. You see a physical kingdom. Right, right now, over in the Far East, Iran is talking about taking Jerusalem away. We want to destroy the Jews. We want to destroy Israel from off the face of the planet. And they're getting ready for another war. Yes, the kingdom of heaven that is centered in Jerusalem, that millennial kingdom that's coming, hasn't come yet, but it's coming, it has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. It happens time and time again. Jesus prophesied it in Matthew chapter 24, that this temple would be destroyed. The whole other study. But see, he messes it up here, and you go down here to the footnote, and he says, Suffereth violence when John the Baptist came preaching the kingdom of heaven. He also came condemning sin and urging repentance and baptism to a new life. Some responded positively, but more reacted violently, as is often true when the gospel is preached. Those who react against the gospel would destroy the kingdom uh, of heaven if they, could, but must, if they could, but must settle for destroying as many of its servants as they can. For example, John will soon be or was soon put to death, as was Christ, and eventually the apostles, as well as multitudes of Christ followers through the centuries. I'm sorry, but that's that's not a good description of that verse. All right, It has nothing to do with people, some people repenting, some people getting right, and whatever else. That's not what this verse is about. And see, he just ruined, totally ruined, a lot of very important scriptures. We're going to see here in just a minute how he does this. He did not rightly in interpret this scripture right here. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ will rule and reign from there at some, you know, after the time of Jacob's trouble, which is coming soon. Now we'll go over here to Matthew chapter 24, and he just continues messing up here in the footnotes. 
Gospel of the Kingdom, Gospel of the Kingdom is recorded simply as the Gospel in the parallel account of Mark 13, 10. And then he goes on to say here, this is, you know, this is basically the Gospel that we're preaching. No. This Gospel comes in the time of Jacob's trouble, towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Alright? Again, not rightly dividing the Scriptures. And Dr. Morris is, is very guilty of that right here. He's not rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And as a result, these notes down here are going to lead people astray. Well, I'm just sorry, that's just the way it is. Uh, jump over here to Matthew chapter 25. Let me go up here to the top so you can see. Matthew chapter 25, parable of the ten virgins. This one it gets butchered big time. Uh, kingdom of heaven. See, note on Matthew 3, 2, which we discussed earlier, he says, it's the same as the kingdom of God. No, it isn't. It's here seen as in its outward aspect of Christian profession. There are no Christians in Matthew chapter 25. All right, you have up here, you know, the, uh, see if I can find it. Uh, well, I'm getting tarried. Uh, here you have, they say, well, the, the lamp, the oil in your lamp is the Holy Spirit. Okay. Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. Can you buy the Holy Spirit? No. This is a reference. They don't go out. Here it says about how that they go out uh, to meet the bridegroom. They are going out to marry the bridegroom. And there's only one virgin. I might present you to Christ as a chaste virgin. The bride of Christ is one. Here you have ten brides going out to meet the bridegroom. This has nothing to do with Christians. Right? There's, I've done a lot of different studies on this. There are many good studies out there on this subject. This has nothing to do with Christians. But so you get this commentary here and he says it does. I, I can't... I cannot recommend this study Bible. This is a bad one. Uh, here we have what I was referring to earlier. 2 Timothy chapter... 3 verse 15 from a child Timothy had been trained in the Old Testament scriptures by his mother and grandmother 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 before any of them knew about Christ this is a powerful testimony to the value of teaching God's word to young, to young children which of course is true but then you go over here see here you have Timothy has the holy scriptures when he, since he was a child he didn't have the original autographs, he had copies. But then you go over here, all scripture. Every individual scripture is included in the reference, not just the thoughts, but the actual writings. The words written down, thus the words are inspired of God. This one verse repudiates the idea of partial inspiration and also that of so-called dynamic inspiration. The true doctrine is plenary verbal inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. Since God is omniscient, the scriptures are therefore infallible and free from error of any kind. Yeah, but the scripture in verse 15 is defined as what Timothy had from the time that he was a child. He had copies. He didn't have the original autographs. Then it goes on down here to talk about the inspiration of God and all this stuff. You know, and then it was, it was God breathed and all that. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. But you see how you're messed up here with the Alexandrian type philosophy. He would have you to believe that this is a reference here that... Holy Spirit inspired scripture here is the original autographs but right down here in verse 15 it says that Timothy had them from the time he was a child. He had copies. So again, you're not going to be helped by the reading these uh, notes here. And and again, you know, I got a little do a little another cut here on this Defender Study Bible. Look at how little scripture you have. And look at how much of his writings there are. Look at that. Majority of the page. And it's not even that great. And I, I have found numerous, numerous errors in his doctrinal stands down here. Alright. Pretty bad. Continuing on. I want to show you one of the little tricks here. And I don't know whether he did this on purpose. I'm not going to, you know, attack him for that. But... This here is, is one of the things you'll see. It says, Keep with His Word. This is the second test of life in 1 John. You know, If we are truly in Christ, we will keep 
that is guard, his word. Uh, simple little English lesson here. Capital W is the manifest word. Lowercase w is the written word. All right, we will keep or guard his word. That's Jesus Christ. This is a reference to the written word. It's a pet peeve of mine. I can't stand it when people do that. I know that there's, they're trying to be reverent and stuff and make the, the word written word of God a capital W, but it's not. It's, it's a lowercase w. Don't get that messed up. All right, here we have index to major topics in annotations. And uh, we go back through just different subjects and where you can find them. Uh, again, this is, this is fine. I don't have a problem with any of this. Authenticity of biblical text. Here we go again. You're going to get some of the Alexandrian type of philosophy. Creation versus evolution as worldviews. And this, this is all, you know, good stuff here. Here we go. Religion, religions based on the two worldviews. Creation, evolution. You know, you have all this stuff here. Uh, over here, evolutionist fruits, which is true. Harmful philosophies that come from it. Evil practices that come from evolution. Uh, creationist fruits, continued, conclusion, logic of biblical creation, uh, outline of earth history as recorded in the book of Genesis. A lot of this is very good. You know, there's I don't have a problem with, with a lot of this stuff. Um, but honestly, I think that this could be better served as being in a book that's not attached to the text of the Bible. Global processes indicating recent creation. Uh, uniform, uniformitarian estimates, age of the earth. There you get into some of the different ways that people date the earth, different things, and it shows the inconsistency here of it. And it goes on and on. There's a lot of different little study helps here, mostly centered around creation science. Uh, Bible-believing scientists of the past, that's kind of an interesting little uh, list there. They claim that science was all founded by evolution and all this. That's nonsense. Creationists founded most of the or people that believed. They weren't necessarily Christians, but people that believed in, in God. They were at least uh, theists or deists. This thing of uh, everything coming from nothing, that's totally unscientific. Uh, you'd have to be an idiot to believe that kind of thing in the Big Bang and all that stuff. Science in the scriptures, uh, different things there. You have hydrology. Again, a lot of good little um, study helps here and everything if you're interested in creation science. Miracles of the Bible, you know, through miracles of providence, quotations from or allusions to Genesis in the New Testament, chronology of the patriarchs in Genesis. Like I said, it's all good stuff, but you know, I would put it into a book and have it separate from the Bible. It's like a little study book or something that would be a help to the Bible. Um, from the biblical prophecies, it goes into that. Um, just a, a lot of different things. I'm not going to look at all this stuff in detail. Deity of Christ, claims of Christ, birth of Christ, resurrection of Christ. Comparisons between cursed world and redeemed world. And through, and then you know, a couple more. I'm not going to go over everything. Concordance, a couple of those. Then you get into the maps. Again, we have the wrong path of the Exodus there. <laughs> but that's basically it. I mean, it goes maps, and then you have one sheet of white paper.
And that's it for the Fender Study Bottle. Little bookmark I have in there. And now the question comes up, would I recommend it? No, I would not. I do not recommend the Defender Study Bible. I'm glad that Dr. Henry Morris is a creation scientist. I'm glad for some of his research that he's done. But when it comes to his explanatory notes in this commentary, and like I said, a lot of the places you have just way too much writing down there. I like, if I'm going to get a study Bible, I don't want whole pages being taken up. You know, you go back to Genesis, and here we have, uh, I think this is Creation of Science Evangelism's disclaimer, saying, you know, watch out, Dr. Morris attacks the King James text a couple times. I appreciate that they put that out. I don't know if they still do or not, but you go back here to Genesis, and look at that. <laughs> I mean, almost the whole page. You know, and, and, you know, okay, I understand creation science, you know, this is the big part here in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. You know, here we ha actually have a whole page of commentary. You know, I mean, write, a, write a book about Genesis or something, you know, I, I don't, I don't like this cluttering up the, you know, I actually have a Dewey Reams Catholic Bible and it looks very similar to this. I have whole pages of, of the writing of man and just give a little tiny bit to scripture up here. Eh, not really so much into that. Uh, I don't recommend this. I, I don't think that this is a good study Bible. I disagree very highly in the inclusion of some of the Alexandrian thought. And, the, you know, no translation is inspired, only the original autographs, all that stuff. It's not going to help out a, a new Christian or even a, a seasoned Christian that knows about things. It's that constant, yea hath God said, that little doubt, that little seed of doubt there. Maybe the text isn't perfect in the King James. Maybe it should be updated. Maybe it should be corrected. Maybe if I'm smart enough, I can correct it myself. I don't recommend this one. Sorry. Okay, here we have the Schofield Study Bible from Local Church Bible Publishers. Uh, of course, the quality of Local Church Bible Publishers Bibles is just exceptional. Got a lot of blank pages here. Holy Bible presentation page. Uh, <clears throat> births, marriages, deaths, husbands, family tree. Wife's family tree, it's a business card, the King James Bible with the C.I. Schofield study notes. Then you have this thing here, the translators to the reader. And this is the full one here, so it's pretty long. You can see it goes through. Two you have Genesis chapter 1, over here talks about, you know, how to use the study Bible and everything else. And basically most of the Schofield notes are fairly limited. They're not going to overpower the page with a lot of text. You can see he gets into some of the things about uh, Genesis chapter 1 there. He does have, <coughs> excuse me, he does have some things to say, so there are some more than some other pages. Uh, you can see some of the notes there. Over here, of course, too. And basically, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. A lot of pages, there's, there aren't any notes there. But here we have just a little bit right there. Uh, let me zip ahead here. Now here we have Mark chapter 16 and you have the disputed last 12 verses there. A lot of the new version is disputed. And he says here the passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Synodic and Vatican. You know, and then he goes on to say well, others do have it and stuff. So I don't like that. I mean you got to watch out for things like this. 
when you start calling the text into question down here in the footnotes and you start putting doubts into people's minds, eh, you're starting to play with fire there. Pretty dangerous. Here we are in John chapter 7. And again, verse 53 through 58. I'm sorry, through chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. It's not found in some of the most ancient manuscripts. And he says about Augustine, declares that it was stricken from many copies of the sacred story because of a prudish fear that it might teach immorality. So again, he's calling the text into question. Now most of your Schofield study notes are going to be all right. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a good example here. He says here, Babylon, confusion is re uh, repeatedly used by the prophets in a symbolic uh, sense. Two Babylons, two Babylons are to be distinguished in the Revelation. Ecclesiastical Babylon, which is apostate Christendom, headed up by, headed up under the papacy. There you go. And political Babylon, which is the beast confederated empire, the last form of Gentile world dominion. Ecclesiastical Babylon is the great whore, Revelation 17, 1, and it is destroyed by the political Babylon, Revelation 17, verses 15 through 18. That the beast may be the alone, may be the alone object of worship, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 4, Revelation 13, 15. The power of political Babylon is destroyed by the return of the Lord in glory. Good note. That's the kind of thing that will help you as a, as a new Christian. Okay, very, very good. But uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. It goes into some of the proper names back here. And uh, subject index, concordance. Sorry, I should be getting this a little bit better on video. All in all, very nice Bible here by local church Bible publishers. They have numerous, uh, numerous Schofield study Bibles. Uh, for a new Christian, I'd say yeah, it's it's pretty decent. But uh, some people have some objections to C.I. Schofield. I'm going to play some of that material right now. So listen to this. Now let me let me jump here a little bit with you too. We know that that this C. I. Schofield, why, he was a rascal. I mean, this guy, uh, you know, he was just like the devil himself, and he's the one that started this whole thing. What he went and done, and he went and he got that little Margaret McDonald girl and got her all drunk up, oh, and, yeah. and, uh, and then she had this dream about the pre-tribulation rapture. I can't believe what, what some of these people write and the way they, you know, they villainize. You know, the first thing I, I look for when I see someone like Scofield, Scope being demonized, is who's doing the demonization? I recently preached a message having the right kind of enemies, having the right kind of enemies, and that was a term old J. Vernon McGee used to use a lot. Oh. It's important that you have the right kind of enemies, and uh, when I when I take a look at who was demonizing C.I. Schofield, uh, then I take a closer look at C.I. Schofield. He wasn't such a demon at all, was he? Well, he was. Uh got a Confederate cross fighting in the Civil War for the Southerners, a brave man, and he was a lawyer by trade after the war and became an Attorney General of Kansas, and he was led to Christ by, when he was led to Christ, he was an unsaved man and a bad drinker, and when he got saved, he dropped everything immediately and began the Lord's work and had a missionary burden and printed the best, the, really the best reference Bible you can get. Now, he'll, he'll fail in three or four places, or five or six, not more than eight. And when a man when a man makes a, a reference Bible, I've heard he's tackled something like, oh, uh, 2,000 references, and only messed up eight times. That's batting pretty tough. That's batting about 900. Uh, J. Finney's Dake Bible has uh, more oh, uh, inspirational stuff in it, but J. Finney's Dake has uh, the charismatic sign as a... Uh, for Gentiles but as Jews, he's got his Bible right, he wrongly divided there. And the Thompson Chain Reference Bible has probably all more uh, outline information in it. But it confuses the judgments and has the white throne judgment for the judgment seat of Christ and the judgment of nations. Hasn't got it straightened out. Now there are others, but actually still the best 
reference Bible a man can get is an old Spofield reference Bible. But one but, thing that was bothering me, I wanted to have a question now. I've studied a lot about Schofield, and I've run into a lot of evidence concerning Schofield of being of a dubious nature. Yes. And I haven't been able to find any evidence that shows these things to be false. Like, for example, here's a writing right here I have in front of me where it talks about when he <laughs> went to prison for a scam, a railroad scam. Yeah. And then this was then after he was saved. It yeah. says, upon his release from prison... Schofield deserted his first wife, Leontine Carey Schofield, and his two daughters, Abigail and Helen, and he took as his mistress a young girl from St. Louis Flower Mission. He later oh. abandoned her for Helen Van Ward, whom he eventually married. Following his Illuminati connections to New York, he settled in at the Lotus Club, <laughs> which he listed as his residence for the next 20 years. It was here that he presented his ideas for a new Christian Bible concordance and was taken under the wing of Samuel Untermeyer, who later became chairman of the American Jewish Committee. Untermeyer introduced Schofield to numerous Zionist and socialist leaders, including Samuel Gompers, Fiorello LaGuardia, Abraham Strauss, Bernard Baruch, and Jacob Schiff. These were the people who financed Schofield's research trips to Oxford and arrange the publication and distribution of his concordance. Oh. That sounds to me like something the ADL might come up with. Well, the question here is real simple. You've read me what a guy wrote. Now, where did he, what, what's his evidence? Yeah, they've got quite a few things. They've got court documents showing the court. I doubt if there are court documents on the, some of the stuff you just read. Yeah, they got court documents on his a number of confidence schemes he was involved in, and they got court documents on what? concerning his divorce. They said he's got... He court left his wife and didn't care, and how then he scammed the wife out of money that the mother had that they were living off. They've got, they've got court document records. Have you seen any of them? Yeah. Now, what I've been looking for oh, you is you know, they some evidence somewhere? that would show these things to be false. Uh, are they in print anywhere? He's asking you, Kenny, these documents. Have you seen these actual documents, or have you seen... Yeah, I've seen uh, copies of them, but have I traced them back and gone to the courthouse and looked at them myself? No, I haven't. All right, so right, then... If you have what copies, I'm looking for is something if you that have will copies, refute... If you have copies of them, are they in a book that you can send me? Okay, uh, Dr. Ruckman's asking you if there are there if there's copies. If you have this stuff, is there are they in a book that you can send him? He'd like to see these. Yeah, there's a number of books that are listed. And the are these books written by? I'm looking at. I mean, just just for my curiosity, are uh, they written by soul winning Bible believing Christians? He wants to know if these books were written by soul winning and Bible believing Christians. Yeah, it looks like it. Looks like here's one called Schofield, The Man Behind the Myth by Joseph Canfield. Now, Joseph Canfield wrote The Incredible Schofield and his book. What else did he write? I'm not sure. All right, get well, ready, Les. He's going to get you. Well, now, my, my wife went to get uh, his address, and it'll take her a couple of minutes, and while she's gone... Okay. I need to, to give you this. Uh, two of my men have done research work on the man who wrote the incredible Schofield, Joseph Canfield, and just sent me a note on what they found out about Joseph Canfield. And the man who wrote the book that that fellow was talking about, the incredible Schofield, his Catholic wife divorced him. He did not desert her. And that fellow Canfield was a, uh, number one, an anti-Semitic, Number two, a five-point tulip Calvinist. Uh -oh. Number three, anti-Jewish. Uh -oh. Number four, anti-dispensational. And he's a preterist. He's anti-premillennial. He's amillennial. And is against the rapture and is against the restoration of Israel. 60. That's Joseph Canfield who wrote the book that he was giving you. 
You All know, right. what you just got done saying, Dr. Ruckman, about that guy Canfield, it's amazing the garbage you find out behind these little liars. Well, these fellas get away with it, and they, 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 they don't tell you the whole truth. Well, you know, the important thing is take a look. I mean, first of all, it's not about Schofield. You know, just like it's not about you or I. Uh, you know, we didn't write the King James Bible. He didn't write the King James. He wrote a commentary. Now, he's either telling you the truth or not. It's up to us to find out, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, just wanted to throw this one in here to the list of study Bibles. A lot of people probably are curious about this thing. Uh, this is a first edition. I do not have a second edition. The Ruckman Reference Bible, uh, Bible Baptist Bookstore down here. I have not been able to obtain a second edition, the newer one yet. I do know that they've gone up pretty much in price. I'll, I will include the page that shows what the prices of them are. I'll show you a screenshot. You can see it actually right here. You can see the different prices there. Eh, pretty expensive. But uh, what about the quality of this thing? Well, let me show you. Some of this will be different, of course, with the newer uh, Ruckman Reference Bible. Uh, there you have Ruckman's signature. And the little shortened dedicatory there to King James. When you go into Genesis, here you have um, his commentary down there, Ruckman's commentary. Uh, pretty good size commentary. Uh, he has a lot to say there in the book of Genesis. There's a pretty big one there. Like I said, I generally like to keep commentary fairly small. I have the different commentaries up up top there of uh, Dr. Ruckman, separate commentaries, separate from the Bible. You can get into a lot more detail in those, of course, than you can in just a little section here. But uh, text is pretty good from this uh, first edition here. I know that there were a lot of corrections that had to be made, which is typical with any any book that you bring out. There are, there are uh, mistakes that are made, things that are spelled wrong. You have to go in, you have to correct it. Um, that's how it is with anything, any kind of production that you do. These videos here, I'm going to have to edit some things. Uh, so, but it, it's it's a pretty good. You can see it has the center column references there. A little bit of a margin, not a real big margin, but the uh, text size is pretty good. Not going to get into some of the things there. Pretty much, I agree with Dr. Ruckman on his doctrinal stands. He's not perfect. As you'll see, thing you know, once in a while, eh, I don't know about that. You know, I have to check into that more. Or I have checked into it, and you're wrong. Whatever. You know, the one thing that you're not going to find in here, in this study Bible, you won't find any Alexandrian philosophy down here. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, the two different types of commentaries, the one will uplift and exalt the text up here. You'll read this, and it'll say. It'll uplift it. The other type of commentary, as I showed you with the Defender Study Bible, the other type will attack the text and question the text. It'll say, well, this isn't really inspired. Maybe there, this was mistranslated and things. You won't find that in Dr. Ruckman's commentary. You can rest assured of that. But uh, you go back here to the back. Here you have Revelation, Epilogue to the Bible. And then index to appendices. And he has a lot of information back here. I'm just going to kind of go down over it. You can look at it here. A lot of very, very interesting subjects. Of course, Dr. Ruckman has an interesting sense of, of humor. <laughs> Doesn't appeal to everybody, I realize, but you're a Bible believer and love the Lord. It, usually will appeal to you. You learn from it. Over here to the next page. 
and uh, just a wealth of information back in here. Uh, some really, really, really good stuff. So there you have that. And then it gets into some of Dr. Ruckman's artwork. There you have the Ark of the Covenant and the Golden Altar of Incense, the censer. And it goes through and we have different things in the temple. What the temple would, the temple would look like. Tabernacle, I mean, in the wilderness. Uh, but just a lot of information. Some stuff you just are not going to find in any other commentary. Uh, he definitely covers some things that a lot of people are afraid to. Um, it's really, really inter interesting information. I can't possibly show all of it. I mean, it goes through here and there's a lot of information. Then you have Dr. Ruckman's different maps that he draws back in here. And there he has the thing of the path of the Exodus. Which again, I'm going to show you in a couple minutes here. One that I think is better. But overall pretty nice maps. Nicely collared. Uh, quality of the paper is pretty good, pretty nice and thick, and you get some blank pages in the back to put notes in. Um, I wanted to include this thing in my Bible, study Bible reviews, uh, different study Bibles that I recommend. It's not really a fair comparison because they they do have a, a updated edition out now, the second edition of this, so I don't have my hands on one of those, but um, it's not going to be changed drastically from this one. And this one I would recommend as a study Bible. Uh, if you want my honest opinion, I don't recommend study Bibles. I just recommend plain text Bibles. But for a new Christian, especially with the dearth of biblical preachers out there today, a study Bible would probably be a good idea. And, you know, we live in a, in a world where you can have multiple study Bibles, you know, way back in the 1300s when John Wycliffe was around, it would cost you, you know, a month's salary sometimes to have a, a book of the Bible, you know, translated well, it was because there were no printing presses back then. Um, so we are very fortunate to be able to have, as a Christian, you can have four, five, six different study Bibles, along with a plain text Bible as your main Bible. Uh, if you feel that's something that you'd like to do, well then go ahead. Um, would I recommend the Ruckman Reference Bible? Yes, absolutely. Mainly because I know I can feel safe recommending this and somebody isn't going to get messed up with Alexandrian philosophy. They're going to come away from reading this, they're going to come away as a Bible believer. They're going to come away believing that they're holding God's Word in their hands. That's why I'll recommend Dr. Ruckman's Reference Bible. Okay, the final Bible in the study Bible uh, issue here, the study Bible video. I have here a The Common Man's Reference Bible. And this one, I have to say, is probably my favorite. As soon as I pulled this thing out of the box, as soon as my hands touched it, it was like, wow. I mean, this, is, this isn't even the best one. They have one that's a lambskin that's, that's one stage above this. This one was $77, the lambskin was $88. Now compare that to what the Ruckman Reference Bible, the highest level, cost you. Uh, this is a good deal. I mean, the, the cover is a, it's like the local church Bible publisher's cover. Really soft, supple leather. I mean, just beautiful. It's nice and, and stitched there. Um, let me zoom in here. You can see the, the stitching on the edge. Very, very nice compared to the glued edge in the Ruckman Reference Bible. 
Uh, this is a very, very nice one. Again, this is, you can see there, cowhide. The printing on the spine is very clear. Come on, focus. Camera doesn't want to focus for me. Printing on the spine is very, very clear, as opposed to some of the, the cheaper ones. You can see there the Thompson chain reference bio, it's kind of a little bit blurry. Yeah, they didn't really get that printed all that great. But this thing here is just really, really high quality. Very, very impressed with this common man's reference Bible. Now let's take a look inside. A couple blank pages in there you can put notes in. Presentation page. Uh, there's a thing, a page talks about uh, you can use this actually as a marriage license, which is a good idea. You know, I don't, I'm not going to get into all that right now, but, but uh, you should not be married by the state. You should be married by under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. you got to watch out for that whole state marriage license thing. Again, like I said, another issue. But right there you have that ability that you could use that. Births, marriages, deaths. It doesn't have the family tree thing like the local church Bible publisher's Bible, but... You know, still very, very good. Uh, here's your presentation page. Um, David Allen Hoffman is the one who put this together. Together, written to uh, him a little bit, and Bible believer. Again, you don't have to worry about looking in here and being, you know, having the text attacked. There you have the little dedicatory, not, not a real big one, preface, and then it goes into the book of Genesis. Now, I generally like to say at least something negative about everything that I have, <laughs> uh, and the only thing, honestly, that I could find, I went through a lot of the notes, the only thing really that I could see that I would disagree with, as far as a you know, doctrinal thing, is here you have he teaches um, a gap theory down here so I had to look there for a minute I didn't have it marked but he teaches a gap theory I don't believe in the gap theory honestly I will not break fellowship with anybody over that issue uh, we've had a member of our church here was a believer in the gap theory most of us don't believe in the gap theory it's fine brother wants to believe in that wants to teach it I'm not going to say it's heretical or some kind of a thing that would make or break a relationship that I have with a brother in Christ. But honestly, this might sound weird. I mean, I didn't read the whole thing from cover to cover. But honestly, this is the only thing I could find in this whole Bible that I disagreed with. And that's pretty rare for me. <laughs> I mean, the notes in here are just really, really, really good. I mean, I really enjoy this brother's... Uh, viewpoints and, and the way he writes. I really appreciate it. Um, you can see the text here is kind of like the my Cambridge Bible that I use. It's not as wide as the Cambridge uh, as far as the whole you know the, the size of the Bible itself but you have these nice margins the whole way around so you can put your own notes in there. His notes that he has are small complementary of the text of course he's not going to question the text down here. Just going to give you little bits here and there. You'll see a lot of scripture references when he puts things, when he puts notes down here, sending you to different places. Um, really good, some really uh, good insights and things down in there. I'm going to go forward here to the, um, well this is an interesting thing here. Let me just zoom in on this, this note here to show you the kind of thing you can expect from this. After men reject the word of God and they rebel against the truth, God blinds their eyes to the truth. Absolutely right. Men of, le men of learning use their education to avoid the truth and unlearned, unlearned men use their lack of education to avoid the truth. <laughs> Both are lazy liars who do not care for the truth. 
The Lord Jesus opens the eyes of the honest and humble seekers of truth. You see, that sounds kind of militant. Uh, this is the kind of speech that you're going to get from a man that cares about you and that loves you as a Christian. When you get somebody who's nice and syrupy and sappy, you know, like a Joel Holstein or somebody like that, you're dealing with a false prophet when you're dealing with somebody like that. I mean, if I see, if I'm walking out through the woods and I see a rattlesnake and I see some kids walking towards the rattlesnake, I'm going to go over and I'm going to beat the rattlesnake into the ground. I'm going to kill it. Okay, I'm not going to go over and say, oh, excuse me, you know. <laughs> no, that, that's not love. True love is warning people and showing, hey, you don't want to do this, you don't want to mess with that. These kind of notes right here are based on a Christian that has an understanding of the truth and loves other Christians enough to tell them the truth, to warn them about the error of the wicked. But uh, going back through here, some really, really good stuff. I'd like to read a lot of these, but I just don't have time in this video. I want to keep it fairly short. Uh, but just, just some really, really neat things that he has to say here. Uh, see if I can find another good thing to use here. Another good little bit of text here in the notes. It says here, the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses subtly moves the comma after the world or word today rather than the word the because their perverted revisers do not want the thief to obtain an immediate salvation without any works. Uh, they also do not want their heresy of soul sleep exposed by the truth of immediate consciousness in the afterlife. So you even you know you'll even get some things like that. And here he says many of the new Bibles of Alexandria uh, remove the vital word Lord. Okay. And then he gives you the scripture reference there, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You want to remove the word Lord. So you see, he warns in, the, in these notes down here, he'll tell you good doctrine, good doctrinal truths, but he'll also warn you about corrupt things. Here you have, it's removed in the corrupt NIV. So you can give this to somebody, and they can, they can know the truth, and they're also warned about some of these cults, like the Alexandrian cult and the Jehovah's Witness cult. It's very, very good. I really like those notes in this Bible. But anyhow, this this one is actually kind of an interesting thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Because you see, it goes back here to the end. And Revelation chapter 22. And you have a couple maps and some note page at the end there. And that's basically it. But look at the thickness of this thing. Compare that to the Ruckman Reference Bible. They're about the same thickness. The Ruckman's Reference Bible has a lot of these notes in the back. But what's the difference? Well, the difference is the text here is you don't really have that much of a margin. But over here with the Common Man's Reference Bible, you have those nice big margins there. So, like I said, I really, really like this thing. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing here. This is, I think, the only Bible that I have that has the, the right path of the Exodus. Uh, you can see right there, as proved by uh, Ron Wyatt. Uh, I went and I was going to bring those videos out here. Went and forgot the DVDs. I'll show it in just a minute. Uh, but uh, very interesting, the story about that. Um, Brother Hoffman here actually knew Ron White. He goes into talking about how that he talked to Ron White about the, the preservation of Scripture. And then here he's talking about it. And uh, Ron White talked to him about the path of the Exodus. Uh, pretty interesting story there. I'd really recommend Ron White's videos on the subject. But this thing here, I would definitely say without a doubt, that of all the study Bibles, of all the Bibles, if you if you wanted to buy one, you know, this this is a nice one here, the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, the uh, Ruckman 
reference Bible and the Schofield uh, Study Bible by put out by local church Bible publishers. If you wanted to buy uh, one of these as a study Bible, I'd say great. But if you actually want a regular Bible, your regular carry Bible that just has some a few small explanatory notes down at the bottom that are going to help you, this is the one I'd recommend. If you could only have one Bible, no study Bibles, you know, not a plain text Bible and then study Bibles too. If you could only have one, if I was reduced down to one, this would be the one right here. Just the feel of this thing. I like a good floppy Bible like that. You know, when you open it, it opens nice and, and flat. You can curve it the whole way around. I mean, the binding is excellent and superb. I'll give you a little comparison here, and, and they probably corrected this, but I'll just show you. Here's the Ruckman Reference Bible. You open that thing up, it's cracking and creaking. <laughs> and it, you know, it's bonded leather. What do you expect? I wouldn't trust really cranking this thing open too far. Alright, this Common Man's Reference Bible, really a good one. Thumbs up on that one. So there you have my recommendation. Okay, uh, there's the different ones. I showed you a little bit of detail into each one. Um, if I was a new Christian and I wanted probably the best all around, you know, one that really would show me compare scripture with scripture, a lot of notes in the back, a lot of helps, I would recommend the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. For new Christians, I think this is a good one. And you're not going to get a lot of uh, notes in it, like over here with the Schofield and the Defender Study Bible. I'm sorry, Defender Study Bible is out of the picture for me. I don't recommend that thing. The Schofield is pretty good. Uh, don't believe all the negative things that you hear about uh, CI Schofield. Um, as you heard there, there's a lot of lies that are made up about the man. This one's this is pretty good. If you need one with commentary, you'll be fairly okay, but there are some notes that are critical of the text. So I can't recommend that first and foremost. Thompson Chain Reference Bible, I think you'd do pretty good to have that one. Not perfect, but still pretty good. Compares scripture with scripture. Here in the middle, as I showed you, Ruckman Reference Bible. You're not going to hear the King James text being corrected by Dr. Ruckman. You'll come, you'll come to this book as a Bible believer and you'll leave as a more intelligent Bible believer <laughs> uh, with some new arguments and things and, and some really good information from this one. This is a good one. A little bit expensive. That's one issue that I have with the second edition of the Ruckman Reference Bible, as I showed you earlier. Price is a little bit high. So that would be one downside to this Ruckman Reference Bible. Uh, the Rainbow Study Bible, as I showed you, don't buy the paperback edition unless you want the thing to fall apart on you. Okay, uh, maybe I got a bad one. Maybe they we're using Elmer's glue or something that day, I don't know, but <laughs> I don't recommend the paperback. Uh, if you can get a, a better edition, maybe a hard cover edition, would I carry this as my main Bible? No. No, I would not carry the Rainbow Study Bible as my main Bible. Um, <clears throat> the Common Man's Reference Bible. Of all the ones that I showed you, as I stated a little bit earlier, if you could only have one Bible, that's the one I would pick. Uh, I have my old Cambridge Bible. It's taped together and notes all scribbled and it's all the pages are wrinkled half the time and, and whatever else. You know, you get into battle as a Christian. You, you use your old sword, your old faithful sword. You get used to it. You get to used to where certain verses are on certain pages. You know, it's pretty difficult to give a Bible like that up. But if I had to, I have a local church uh, note-taker's Bible, which I really like. But if I 
really just had could have one Bible, I think I'd have to say this one. I'm just very impressed with this one, and it's not even the best one. <laughs> okay, you can go to the lambskin one for $88, I think plus shipping and handling. Man, you'd have you'd have a top of the line Bible. Really like this. Um, I should note it's not a, a red letter edition. It's black letter, which my Cambridge is that way. I'm I'm used to it. Not a big issue to me. Some people like the red letter edition. You know, if that's what you're into, well, there's some other good ones. I think the the uh, Thompson yeah the Thompson Chain Reference Bibles red letter. You know, you could do that. Ruckman Reference Bibles red letter. So if you want to spend the extra money, get the Ruckman one, get the red letter edition. To me, not a big deal. Uh, so that's going to be my suggestions for the different Bibles out there. Um, the King James Bible is really all you need. The Lord can lead you and direct you into the truth. Uh, there's other ones out there. I, I don't know about those. You know, I can't do reviews on everything in print. Uh, Defender Study Bible, I wouldn't mess with it because it's just too critical of the text. I don't, I don't like that. Uh, so, get a Bible. Pray before you read your Bible. That's something a lot of people don't do. They just, you know, flip it open. I got 10 minutes I can read, you know, and let me see how many chapters I can get done here, you know. And, and this thing of, of, you know, I've been through the Bible a hundred times, you know, and, you know, like you get through it and you ding, you ring a little bell or something. What do you read the Bible for? So you can you know, mark another one there so you can say, I've been through a hundred times or something. I'm not into that. You know, when you read the Bible, it should be a reverent thing. It should be, you open the Bible and you should pray. And you say, Lord, show me what your word says today. Help me to concentrate. <laughs> I know that's a challenge a lot of times. I know for me, you know, my mind starts wandering. I'll read, a, I'll be reading, trying to read a whole chapter and I'll read a verse and it'll trigger thoughts in my head and I'll start thinking about, yeah, you know, that's true. This, I remember that time that guy did, Next thing you know, you're off in la-la land, you know, and you got to come back to reading the Bible. Help me to understand your word. Help me to, to concentrate as I read. You know, show me what I should do with my life. Those are the kind of things that you should pray before you even read your Bible, your King James Bible. And the Lord will show you amazing things. And if you can find a good study Bible that will link verses together, like the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, great. You can find a good... Bible that, that exalts the text, like these three right here, the Schofield, with that little warning about some of the Alexandrian stuff in there. But still, a lot of the, the notes in your Schofield will be good. If you can get a study Bible like that and learn from it and study, great. Absolutely. We're very rich here in this country and in this world, the English-speaking world is very very rich very fortunate you know in the first century people weren't carrying around Bibles much less study Bibles you know I mean we are very fortunate today and the poorest Christian you can be below poverty level you got a King James Bible in your hands you're rich you're wealthy if you're saved they put that in there too um, so that's gonna be it for the study Bibles uh, thank you very much for watching. I got a lot of other projects planned. I'm really going to try to start hitting hard on the videos again. Start putting out a lot, a lot of them. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.